Good afternoon and welcome to our Racial Equity and Advancing Cultural Humility Reach for Organizational Change Learning Session Using Data for Equity. Um, I am Leela Cardi. Uh, I am an Operations and Tech Support Coordinator at C4 Innovations, one of MHTTC's partners, um, and I'm so excited to have you all here today. Um, just to go through a few brief housekeeping items. Microphones are going to be muted um, at, during today's presentation at designated times. For example, during the Q&A session, you can use the raise your hand feature to request an open mic. When speaking, please be sure to eliminate background noise. You can also submit questions throughout the presentation using the chat and those will be collected and answered at the end. Um, we're also pleased to offer the option of closed captioning for this webinar, which has just come in. Um, so please, you can go ahead and select uh, whether you'd like to view it or not at the bottom uh, by clicking the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom screen on your menu bar. And then also registration confirms your consent to receive an evaluation follow-up email uh, and your consent to recording. If you experience any technical issues, please let us know uh, via the chat and we'll be sure to answer as soon as we can. Um, just looking at our disclaimer, our funding comes from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, the views and opinions expressed in today's session are those of the presenters and moderators, not SAMHSA. And then also to go on to our language, as you can see, folks have their pronouns in their name. Uh, you can feel free to add yours as well. Um, and we use person-centered, affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all activities. During this session, please ensure that whenever you are contributing to our discussion, that you also use language that is affirming, respectful, and strengths-based. And now it is my pleasure to turn over our session to Maria Restopro Toro, co-director of the New England MHTTC. Hand it over to you, Maria. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, thank you and welcome everybody. Um, my name is Maria Restrepo Toro and I work at the Yale Program on Recovery and Community Health. And I am the co-director of the New England Mental Health ETC. Uh, the New England Mental Health ETC is one of the 10 regional centers funded by SAMHSA. Our mission is to support and disseminate evidence-based mental health practices across New England. Our REACH series presents this opportunity to consider ways to develop and input practice policies and practices to ensure cultural responsiveness and equity. Into these sessions, um, just to uh, a very brief overview, and you can definitely uh, uh, access all our resources for free and our trainings and technical assistance. We have four goals, and we're here to serve the region, to foster alliances. Today, we're going to be really learning about the importance of support of immigrants and refugee children and families to connection and communication. So that's what the New England Mental Health DTC, building community partnerships and family is a very important part of our work. I'm very excited to meet and hear from our speakers. Uh, it is um, really a pleasure to have our guests from Yale University. It's now my turn to turn it over back to Janan, uh, who will set up the stage for the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. All right, next slide, please. I will be introducing our speakers for this early morning session, uh, and I'm very excited to do so. <clears throat> Our first speaker, next slide please, is Freshda, Freshda Ganjavi. She is a former Afghan refugee, community advocate, public speaker, and the founder and executive director of Elena's Life, a nonprofit-based um, organization in Connecticut. Additionally, she works for the Refugee Council USA. Her passion lies in empowering refugee families through health education, personalized ESL tutoring, and cultural community exchange programs. Her ultimate goal is to advocate for education, storytelling, insurance, and employment rights for everyone, regardless of their immigration status. Rushdahl also has included a quote that I will read as a part of today's uh, setting the foundation for today's talk. Refugees contribute to our country. We are entrepreneurs, essential workers, advocates, and neighbors. Our nation had the infrastructure to welcome refugees, and now is the time to stand out as a nation of refugees. 
Our next speaker for this uh, webinar is Dr. Julia Rosenberg. Julia is an assistant professor of pediatrics at Yale University in the School of Medicine. She is a co-founder of the EMPOWER, uh, which stands for Emotions Program Outside the Clinic with Wellness Education for Recent Arrivals, which is a program. Um, she's also, <clears throat> I'm sorry, a program for preventative mental health and wellness intervention. As the associate director of the Yale Pediatric Refugee and Immigrant immigrant clinic, and as the health services researcher, she works alongside community members and organizations to support immigrant and refugee children and families to thrive. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning. I am going to ask that we stop sh sharing screen. We're gonna hand it over to our presenters so that they uh, have the opportunity to share their slides and we will get started with today's presentation. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. It's really an honor to be here. And it's lovely to also to hear about um, kind of the grounding principles. We're always learning. So um, thinking about making sure to have uh, our language and the way that we talk about all of these um, really important issues uh, front and center. I'm sure I will continue to make mistakes, but I um, really appreciate kind of this welcoming environment for um, an opportunity to discuss uh, these important aspects. So I'm really honored to be here alongside um, uh, Freshta Ganjavi, and as well as Dr. Francis Chang, who's joining us as well, to speak about supporting refugee family mental health through prevention and community partnership. So we did want to start with introductions. Um, uh, we're very thankful for these introductions that you already started with. So just a little bit more on how we're all connected as well. And we also hope that this can be an opportunity for all of you who are here to introduce yourselves in the chat too. So just kind of saying uh, who you are and where you're coming from and, and connections that you may have with your communities too. Um, so again, I'm Julia Rosenberg. I am um, a pediatrician at Yale University and I work alongside many partners um, supporting refugees and immigrant health, including in our pediatric refugee and immigrant clinic. And Fereshta, if you want to introduce yourself too. Thank you, Dr. Rosenberg. This is Fereshta Nganjavi. I'm founder and director of Elena's Light, a nonprofit organization in Connecticut. And we are working along with the Yale and some other project to help and support our community, especially refugee women and children. And uh, thank you for having us and inviting us. Looking forward to talk and work more with the, this great group. And Francis Chang has joined us as well as one of our partners. Francis, if you want to introduce yourself too. Yes, um, I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm also a pediatrician, a pediatric hospitalist at Yale University, and also work closely with Freshta, Julia, and other partners um, to support refugee health education in our community. Um, so the objectives that we have for um, our discussion today is to take some time to talk about some of the unique mental health risk factors that immigrant and refugee children and families may face. We'll talk about identifying some of the challenges that immigrant and refugee families may face when looking to obtain needed support for mental and behavioral health concerns. We'll talk about some of our experiences of approaching, approaching cultural humility and respect for language and culture, um, again, an ongoing learning process. Um, and then talk about ad and identify opportunities to improve mental and behavioral health supports through community partnerships. So to begin with some background, um, this frame framing of thinking about uh, stressors that immigrant and refugee families may face that is um, unique for those who have had these experiences can often be helpful to think about the stressors um, and then ongoing supports that they we may be able to provide through these three different kind of categories. There are pre-migration stressors. So those are experiences that may have occurred in one's home country, such as being exposed to a war-torn region. Migration stressors. So that can be the journey itself um, and thinking about uh, the stressors that may have been faced on the journey, and also places where um, uh, our, our patients, clients, and neighbors may have spent time throughout their journey. Um, most recently and notably, that may be um, uh, for people who have come from Afghanistan, for example, many have spent time at U.S. military bases before going to their final destination, um, interim countries. Uh, for those who may have crossed the U.S. southern border, they may have spent time at detention centers, whether that's um, the detention centers that are for adults or for children. So just understanding that process and what may have occurred before coming to the United States and their final destination. 
And then thinking about post-migration stressors. Um, and this really is where we can think about how to make a difference and where um, a lot of the, even though there many immigrant and refugees have faced really significant challenges um, on the road to coming to the United States, it is often the post-migration stressors. So concerns related to whether that be housing, employment, we find that many immigrant and refugees who have come into the United States um, have had a high education um, in their home country that doesn't get respected upon arrival here. So then all of a sudden there's this change in feelings of dignity, of, um, of purpose and meaning, which can make a huge difference for individuals. Um, and then also things such as social support, um, having a community, there's a lot that gets lost um, upon arrival to the, the United States and thinking about all of these types of post-migration stressors can be really helpful as we think about how to support these families. Fareshda, do you have any stories to share of post-migration stressors from families that you're working alongside? Yes, uh, when people are back home, there is different stress than when they are here in the U.S. When they come here, there is like a status of new culture, new country, new situation. Um, as I have a family who came from Afghanistan, their husband and wife both were artists and recently bought a house, recently built a, their home at their home countries. But since they came here, they don't have it. They lost everything. They were on the way in the different camps for several months until they end up here coming to Connecticut. And right now when they are here, they start everything from zero one of the things the um father of the family told me like i'm thinking it takes 30 years for me to build my small life in cover and right now how many years it will take i until i start again everything from zero that i don't know from this community um, these are all stress that you don't know what's will really happening in your future you are safe here but still there is a lot of things coming up along with the difficulty of navigating the system and how to have a new life here in the US. Thank you so much, Freshda. Um, and so when we think about all of these stressors that families and individuals face, they really can be thought of as adverse childhood experiences, um, which are known to cause adverse effects on neurobiologic development. Um, and so when there are ongoing stressors, both in the past and then going forward, these can have real effects on children's ability to have emotional regulation on their learning and academic performance and memory and executive function. And we also are concerned about things like post-traumatic stress and related disorders, intergenerational effects. So thinking along the lines of epigenetic changes as well, in addition to um, the stressors of kind of uh, having family members who've been, who have experienced these events in their home countries. And all of this can lead to chronic disease risks. And um, as many are aware, this is related to um, adverse childhood experiences, which have, there have been kind of seminal studies in understanding the, the sequelae on both mental, physical, and behavioral health for uh, individuals who've had these experiences. And um, those who have gone through the immigrant or refugee experience um, are likely to have had adverse childhood experiences and face toxic stress. Um, and so this graphic from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, you can see this mechanism affecting, again, generational uh, in, or historical trauma can affect uh, individuals in addition to ongoing social conditions, these adverse childhood experiences can result in disrupted neurodevelopment, uh, issues with social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, and then concerns about risk behavior, uh, disease and disability, social problems, and ultimately physical and mental health problems that can result in, in early death. So um, there's a lot to think about in terms of the potential stressors that children have faced and may continue to face. But it's really important to also think that we have an opportunity to promote wellness, to promote thriving, and to think about strengths that we can continue to foster. And this is really where we can make a difference is in this post-migration period. Um, and so thinking kind of how can we support post-migration well-being? It's thinking about ways to bring down all of these stressors and support well-being. So uh, some of the stressors that we can think about and address include family isolation, um, problems with acculturation. We see this a lot as children become uh, more familiar with a new culture, um, with classmates and in school and a, a separation and tension can happen within families about what they're observing from their home culture and how to support that. 
um, and continue identifying with one's own culture and background. There's a lot of concerns right now about discrimination and bullying that we're seeing more and more frequently too, um, as well as concerns for um, economic and neighborhood disadvantage that we can help to support and improve. So we can think about how to promote family and peer support, look for state safe and stimulate, stimulating environments for families, thinking about providing um, evidence-based interventions um, that might be tailored for immigrant and refugee children, which is a lot of our focus. So things like social emotional learning, um, uh, supporting healthy habits related to sleep, nutrition, and exercise, and thinking about how we can really move these evidence-based interventions um, for immigrant and refugee children and make it accessible for them. Um, and uh, we know that that there are these needs and opportunities to support thriving, but we also need to think about kind of what may be standing in the way of allowing us to get these resources and supports for immigrant and refugee families. So some of these barriers may include language barriers. Um, challenges with parental literacy. So this can include the direct language, but also being able to read um, materials in one's own language. For example, in Afghanistan, about half of women are unable to read um, their native languages as well. So being aware of this too. Finding culturally concordant providers, so individuals who are able to provide um, support that we're looking for in a way that is culturally respectful, um, and uh, again, having language services available and finding that trust. And we also know that there are unique stressors that some people may be less familiar with treating and understanding and evaluating um, when it comes to the refugee and immigrant experience. And also when it comes to screening, we have a lot of wonderful screening tools available to identify anxiety, depression, and other mental or behavioral health concerns or developmental concerns. Um, but many of these, even if we have are lucky enough to translate it, may have idioms or may not capture the underlying conditions that we're looking for. So we have a lot of barriers when it comes to trying to understand them. And of course, there's also a changing political landscape. So on top of all these known barriers, we've seen a lot of fear when it comes to trying to uh, come to medical care or mental health care. Um, and this has uh, been seen in the literature as well, for example, with some of the anti-immigrant policies that were passed around um, the last administration. Uh, it was shown that about a million children fewer were enrolled in Medicaid. Um, and so we're seeing real, real effects from, from fear of what the repercussions of kind of coming to care may be, even if there should be no Fear and we could be able to reassure individuals. Fareshta, do you have any uh, stories to share about barriers to care for the families that you're working with? Yes, during my three years working as a healthcare coordinator at the resettlement agency and my own experience, I saw like, mm, I can tell <laughs> days stories about all of these barriers that you mentioned here. But one of them is, which is very important, is the cultural differences. I would like always focus on that. Um, for example, in my own family, um, that's uh, it's it's clear when you go to the doctor, it's emphasized to not tell them what pain you have. Just say I'm sick, and if it's a good doctor, they can find out what you are doing well uh, or not not communicating with the doctor can come from not trusting the provider or not thinking those are good providers or not talking with the provider and communicating which give them tools and to find out what's the issue and they can find out about it and give you prescription or give you the test that you need it not communicating with the doctor that's something culturally a lot i have seen when they go to doctor they're not answering the questions the way they should answer to help the doctor find out it's good to focus to ask them several times make sure they understand it make sure they answer the questions the way you need it and creating trust between provider and the client or patients is one of the things always i'm trying to make that if the appointment is in rush in like trying to do everything in the manner of time it's better to be uh, a little bit more clear with families and one other thing is the political change uh, as i as you may i know I may, you may know a lot of afghani people came last year they are on their uh, they came as a humanitarian polar not all of them accepted as a refugee they have some benefits but this benefit will stop after a certain time 18 months 
then they have to apply for asylum. During this gap to apply for asylum and accepting for the asylum, we're sure there would be a lot of people without insurance for a while. And those gap time is kind of political change. If they accepted right away as a refugee, they had services such as insurance for longer time. But right now with this system in place, uh, there would be a gap until they get insurance. Um, I hope um, they will accept the Afghan Adjustment Act, which send it to Senate, Senate and, and deny for several times. If that act accepted, same as the refugee who came from uh, Syria or who came from different country, they were accepted as a refugee and they had the services such as insurance and there would be healthier lifestyle for them. Uh, versus this situation, it takes longer for them to accept and have a, a legal document to be in the country. Thank you for sharing that perspective. And we can see some of these barriers being shared in the chat. So thank you for sharing that as well. Um, and so, you know, there's, um, we've seen that there's these opportunities to think about how we can address, address these barriers and really promote the strengths that we see in our communities around us. And so we're going to take some time to speak on how we've made some of these connections with Elena's Light, um, our university um, and hospital, uh, the EMPOWER program, which again stands for Emotions Program outside the clinic with wellness education for refugees, and Y Healer, which is the Yale Health Education and Literacy for Asylees and Refugees. Um, so Fareshta, can you talk a little bit about Elena's Light? Thank you so much. This is one of my interesting parts talking about Elena's Light because that's related to my own life. I came here as a refugee with my mother um, in 2011. We were two women, both had a lot of medical issues, and we had a bigger vision than being physically here. Myself, when I was in the GFK, that was one of my goal to change the world the way I want. But when I get to my small apartment here in New Haven and had a struggle finding my way from my house to the downtown, and then back home, I was thinking I cannot do any of these things. But I had a great mother, I had a great community, and I stand on my feet, try to ask, try to learn English, try to be myself, what I had the potential from back home, make it alive here. I cannot do this without the great community we have here. After I get a little bit empowered myself, I saw my community, the community I love and passionate for them. The community is part of my blood. And I worked with them since I had 12 years old when I became a teacher at that time. Uh, I was thinking this is the community that we have in Connecticut. When I, was, I was, when I was in a different country as a refugee, I was always uh, happy for the people who are here. I'm thinking, wow, they're going to be all uh, professionals. When I came here, I saw a different phase. I was shocked to see, no, not all the refugee women are the places they, they should be. Not all of them have access to education. Not all of them have access to the care for the health or mental health. A family who came 20 years ago is the same as family who came four years ago. I was feeling like there is a gap, there is a barrier. Getting connecting to the access to this health education system, it's a little bit far from the family who are at home a mom with seven kids that mom has to take care of herself take care of seven kids take care of the family being a leader in the family uh, and also learn some language from the culture it's hard for her to start getting learning the language um anyway it was hard to get access to the um, to the education there is a different way i can talk about that i saw elena's light as a group to help this community get connected from uh, from their homes to the community. Our community, we start having several women, uh, several people as a volunteer. We are connecting one on one to teach them English, to teach them how to get driver license, how to get past the citizenship test, and how you can communicate with the doctors, communicate with the teachers. Like we try to customize a woman ESL classes based one on one teaching. Also, we try to work and have uh, health classes for them instead of them to go 
university from now and learn the university or colleges such as Yale come to them and teach them the life skills uh, education. They can have a peaceful life here and navigate the health and education system in, uh, especially in, in the United States and Connecticut. Our mission is to build brighter future for refugee women and children. And I'm when I say that this is I really want to build this brighter future for the woman. When I see they send me a text message of saying, oh, I got the driver license. I got my citizenship. I was able to communicate with my doctor today. These are make myself happy, make themselves happy. And that will build this brighter future for the refugee woman. Um, one little thing, I don't want to take too, get um, your time too much. Elena's light. Everyone asks me why Elena's light. Elena in Farsi means light, bright future. And also in our community, some people, woman's name is taboo. They never mention a woman's name. That's why we said, okay, let's break this taboo and have this woman name, Elena, as the organization name. Elena is also my first daughter's name as well. Second part is light. Light means education. We try to bring this education to the family's home. They can get it, absorb it, use it, and bring it back to the community. My wish is to see all of these children you see in the pictures be one day sitting at the, at the offices, be a lawyer, be a nurse, be a doctor, be a manager, be a governor, and serve our ch children and serve our next generation. Thank you. Thank you, Farishta. It, it is, it's just so amazing what you have built from what you identified as, as a need and have created such strong bonds within the community. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our immigrant and refugee clinic, and then we'll talk about our partnerships as well. Um, so this photo is of our directors of our adult and pediatric refugee and immigrant clinic. So on the left is Dr. Anamalai, who directs the adult clinic, and on the right is Dr. Camille Brown. Um, they're standing outside of our new, uh, relatively new offices, uh, where both adult and pediatric clinics are located, um, embedded within our, our general clinics. Um, and there was a recently a New Haven Register article that kind of highlighted some of the work that we do. The refugee and immigrant clinics can look different in um, many different places and institutions. Uh, in our pediatric refugee and immigrant clinic, uh, as well as most, what we do is this initial um, refugee health assessment, which is required within the first 30 to 90 days of arrival. And then for most families, we be become the medical home for the children. So they continue to see us throughout um, uh, their first year. And what I really, or sorry, more, many times throughout the first year and then ongoing for their medical, medical care. Um, but what I loved about this article too is a quote from Dr. Brown um, that really kind of embodies a lot of what we've all learned together is that beyond offering primary care, I think we see it as a little bit more. We are supporting families with their medical needs, but also their social needs. With interpreters, social workers, and others, we have quite a multidisciplinary team. And just to highlight some of what that ends up looking like, this was right in the middle of the pandemic when we had a chance to attempt to make the, these boxes align and say we love refugees. So these are some of our residents, nurses, uh, coordinators, interpreters who are on the line here. Um, and then along the bottom here, I have just some of the examples of some of the support structures we have in place that may look different in every clinic, but to give you an idea of, of, of how we're able to try to continue to provide support and think about critically of how to provide support. Um, the first box on that bottom left is the Yale Patient Navigator logo. It's a little hard to read, but this is from their website. Um, this is a program that was started and founded by medical students and continues to run. Um, it was started to support adult um, refugee healthcare navigation. So thinking along the lines of helping to make sure that follow-up care occurs, prescriptions are filled, questions are answered, being that liaison and med medical students have played a key role in that. Um, and that continues to be something that's ongoing, not only for the adult side, but we also have it av available for the pediatric side um, and for our community in general. Um, we also think about care coordinators and they can come from um, many different institutions. So care coordinators that we now have through our, our volunteer medical students, but we have official avenues to follow for that as well through uh, community organizations, through our uh, state Medicaid program and intensive care management, as well as through refugee resettlement agencies. Um, so the 
The logo there is for IRIS, which is our New Haven-based refugee resettlement agency, Integrated Refugee and Immigrant Services. We have another one in Connecticut, in Bridgeport, Connecticut, called Siri. So we work closely alongside the, the healthcare navigators and caseworkers who can help to support um, our, the needs of our families. Of course, Ellen is Light is integral now um, and has really helped to fill a gap after um, there's fewer connections with some of the refugee resettlement agencies over time. Um, and then the school system has started to be a really important partner for us to think about. Um, it always has been, um, but what Dr. Brown, the pediatric refugee uh, uh, director, clinic director, really initiated alongside um, uh, IRS educators uh, is to create uh, monthly forums where we bring together uh, educators, uh, uh, school-based health center providers, uh, mental health providers, physicians, community members, religious leaders, all in one place to just talk about what we're seeing and see how we can support each other. One of the things that has come up most recently from these conversations is we found out that a lot of children who have arrived from Afghanistan recently are not eating at school. Um, and so this was an opportunity for us to all talk together and understand this is likely related to making sure that the food is halal um, and making sure that the, the children felt comfortable that the food was halal and that the parents can tell the children which food is halal. Um, and now we're having ongoing meetings with uh, food, food services at the schools, with community leaders, thinking about educational initiatives. And this all came from these ongoing conversations kind of within the community. Um, I also wanted to take a moment, just a couple of the practical tips and tricks of communication that are uh, constantly evolving. Um, but in addition to using professional medical interpreters and um, professional medical interpretation techniques, um, being sure to talk directly to the patient or the client that you're speaking with, just some of the nuances to think about too. One is that there's often preferences for gender and people may not be comfortable speaking um, to a male interpreter, for example, from some backgrounds um, or the dialect may not be correct, even if the language is technically correct. And sometimes people may even know the interpreter who's on the line or who comes in person. Um, and so being aware of these issues and, and being ready to request a new interpreter if needed um, is a really important aspect uh, to be able to, to facilitate communication. Um, when it comes to thinking about translation and materials, we want to think about literacy. So again, many people are not able to read, even if we do have the ability to translate materials in the written word into the, uh, their native language. So we've started to think about how to use recordings and voicemails. So while we're with an interpreter in the room, using voicemails or voice memos or calling the family um, and while we're in the room and telling them, please don't answer the phone and leave a voicemail um, uh, with the information that they need. We've also learned to print physical calendars. So rather than just having the date written down for an upcoming appointment, printing a physical calendar, sorry about that, and then writing the information um, on the actual date in the calendar can be helpful as a visual tool. Um, and when it comes to facilitating follow-up, being really proactive. So involving a care coordinator if possible, um, having reminder calls in the, the preferred language if possible, and if not, using those tools and ideas that we talked about, like voice memos, um, getting releases of information signed proactively, so we're able to communicate with, for example, specialists or people who you're referring with, um, and then using tools like Teach Back. So after having stated everything with an interpreter, um, instructions, whether that's medications to take or the next follow-up appointment or the next steps, um, having um, that family member tell that back to you can be really important to help to facilitate that communication and, and closing that loop. Um, and then uh, another program, so now we're kind of moving on to some of these community partnerships that we have. And again, a lot of these uh, partnerships are only possible because of our connection with Ellen is Light. Um, and so the EMPOWER program, again, stands for Emotions Program Outside the Clinic with Wellness Education for Refugees. Um, this is a program that really came from our identified gaps that we were talking about, where we're seeing that there are these problems, but we're having a lot of challenges getting people into care and seeing all of these community supports and, and opportunities to promote um, some of the strengths that we're seeing within the community as well. Um, and so this was a program that was developed alongside a pediatric neuropsychologist, Dr. Trisha Ryan, um, and many community, community members directly, where we tried to adapt evidence-based tools specifically for refugee and immigrant children. Um, 
Um, and what we've been doing is partnering with Olin is late to do this during the summer and deliver it to children during the summer. It, it happened right in the middle of the pandemic that we started. So you can see we had these tents that we kind of separated by families. We welcome children um, and we're able to participate in a host of activities. What we usually do is include activities related to topical health. So that often has to do with COVID-19 safety. So you can see that information front and center in multiple languages. Um, we work on, we, we focus on uh, physical um, wellness. So usually some physical activity related to yoga, mindfulness as well. And then we really focus on, on, on um, prevention and the idea with prevention for mental health um, is through tools related to social emotional learning and trying to introduce families and children to concepts related to emotions and making it fun. So a lot of games and activities related to learning about emotions, um, bingo and word finding games and um, learning and using these words a lot. And we're using co-creation. So having families share the words that they're using, the words that they think about kind of filling in those blanks so we can learn from one another about ways to express feelings and emotions. And the idea is to lay the groundwork, really flood children with this information about emotions to get them used to talking about it so that hopefully we can open the door in the future to be able to provide ongoing support when we know there have been traumatic experiences. Um, and so uh, we've been able to pilot this and um, you can see some familiar names here, including Fareshta in terms of uh, the program that we piloted so far. And now we're working to also bring it within the school systems and with, within some of the after school programs that the refugee resettlement agencies conduct. And again, it's really overlapping the ideas of bio, biological health, psychological health, social health, and looping the family into support. Um, and we're seeing that with what families are saying too. Um, what we love is that that children are kind of bringing this home to the family. So they're saying, I learned through, through my kids or after um, we've seen several activities that you do with the kids, now we know to sit with them and do a real activity, painting, requesting things to do. That's gonna be more helpful um, than just taking them outside and then bringing them home. We have to be more meaningful with what we are doing with them. They can learn something from us and do a real activity with them. That was a really good outcome for this program for me and my wife. Or before the kids were at home with no physical activity, now they practice the sport they did in the outside. They're active and inspired us to be active too. Um, what I really love is this is somebody who was not, we had family members coming, but he said, I was not involved directly in the class. I had two jobs, but when I came back, I saw they were playing at home. So, so much, so many things going on in these families, so much work that they're doing to support each other. And then to be able to share things with the children and, and some of the parents and have it shared with the whole family um, is something that we're trying to aim for here. Um, and I will pass it over to Francis and Fareshta to talk about Y Healer as well. Uh, Fareshta, if you want to talk a little bit about your connection with Y Healer, and then Francis can take over. Uh, sure. Yeah, I remember when I was in a conference uh, in before the COVID <laughs> happening in 2019 or 18, uh, they were, we were talking with uh, several doctors and how we can help refugees more. And I had the model of in-home classes for, uh, in-home classes for ESL. And then they were like, we were thinking why we shouldn't have these in-home classes for health instead of having, have it in a different group. Then we start having this uh, a connection with Y Healer. They were established and working with different organizations before. And then start connecting with Elena's Light. We are uh, collecting some families in one house. And then uh, Y Healer team very professionally came to the house and they start teaching to the woman. It was very interesting. I had a lot of great feedbacks. Many of the family loved this connection. They were excited to see the doctor who they seen at uh, at the clinic at their homes and communicating and start making this, um, you know, provider trust between them. They were very able to uh, get engaged with the families. It was like kind of win-win for the both sides. I was like, the family were very excited about that too, especially the family who had disabled kids they were able to communicate with the doctors more openly than uh, others. They could she did, uh, show them what's happening in their home setting. Uh, after the COVID came up, uh, we had to change everything and see the have the classes instead of in person online. 
we had difficulty, some technical difficulty at the beginning, but I think the family learned how to use Zoom and get much easier. We are still working with them and have now five to 10 uh, families each time. There is a different subject and uh, the families are coming and enjoying the learning process. Uh, I believe uh, Y Hiller team have a pre and post test and they come up with a lot of great uh, information how that's helped the family but Elena's light and myself are very happy and proud to be uh, working with this group and you know transfer education to the families which would be a big need for them um dr francis thank you Prashta. yeah it's been a privilege to work with you and um <clears throat> with julia as well um on why healer um and providing these classes for the families. Um, so just a little bit of background. Um, we started it uh, in 2016 as a group, a community academic partnership to provide health education classes um, for the refugee community. Um, it was a partnership between health professionals and the uh, uh, refugee resettlement organizations. Um, and uh, we since 2016, we have provided um, over 30 uh, classes on uh, over 20 different topics, reached over 300 participants. Um, and um, our topics have included COVID-19 safety, nutrition, maternal health, navigating the healthcare system, common illnesses, and children's health. And as Julia and Fresh mentioned, it really did grow out of this desire to kind of narrow the gap um, between uh, language, culture, transportation um, barriers to healthcare access for refugee families. Um, and it has been very rewarding to um, be able to partner with organizations like Elena's Light. Um, initially, we started off having classes in um, a community uh, organization uh, at the Refugee Resettlement Agency. And, um, and then we also started providing, as Freshman mentioned, in 2018 classes in patient homes. Um, during COVID, we transitioned to a virtual platform um, and started to provide classes uh, virtually. And um, we also, um, on this slide, we also started a program with Elena's Light to have women from the community uh, to train women from the community to teach their own health classes. Um, so that's our community ambassador program. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so uh, these are just some photos of um, the in-home classes that we've had with Elena's Light. Um, so on the right, you can see um, during our child uh, health curriculum, um, one of the physicians talking with um, the children, and then um, this, um, and then to the left is also another class, um, I think on parenting or nutrition, um, where they're talking to the parents there. Um, some of the activities that we did when we were in person, specifically for the child health classes, um, were really fun because we would bring the parents and the kids together. Um, so for example, for a child safety class, we had a life-size street where they could practice crossing the street together. For a parenting class, um, we also brought blocks so that the parents could play with the kids and kind of learn um, uh, and kind of um, be able to have um, interactive play that way. Um, and then the other pictures down below are um, from our Zoom classes where we had our COVID classes and we also have topic specific classes um, on uh, things like diabetes and smoking cessation. Um, so uh, these are some quotes from some of the kids who um, have attended some of our classes. One said, I felt doctors are part of our family and was surprised and happy to learn from them. I really liked the idea and told myself that one day I will be a doctor who can help families in their homes. Another said, I was happy to see Dr. X in my neighbor's house. I found out that doctors are not scary and not going to give us medication all the time. They're very friendly and can be funny sometimes. And then um, a parent said, I feel more at ease as a parent. You can go to the next slide. Um, so we, we've also had some um, 
a lot of our providers are also trainees. And so we have also been able to show um, kind of a mutual benefit in that um, the trainees are also able to um, learn how to give community-based health education to refugees and also learn some core competencies in, and um, some cultural humility as well. Um, so as uh, uh, you know, Fresh and Julia said, you know, it's really been a privilege to work with the community um, and our goal really is to empower the refugee participants um, as, and the community as parents kind of gain confidence to advocate for their for their kids and themselves through the US healthcare system. Thank you. And then for us, gonna share about Afghan Women's Circle as well. Yeah, regarding the work that we do, we start having Afghan Women's Circle program in uh, New York area. Uh, we are working with um, three other nonprofit organization there. Uh, for the newly Afghan arriving in New York, we had this uh, five session training and we talk about the language, imp employment and cultural uh, components and women's health, financial literacy. The classes were about like all of the subjects that you see, they were like very intense five sessions. They had like that this last weekend we had graduation. Uh, event for them it was really interesting to see all of these women who came recently from afghanistan are kind of different than the refugee who came a few years ago most of them had their own life they were a doctor nurses they had their own jobs their own families kind of established it during these 20 years were Taliban born there, they built a new life there. Uh, right now they lost everything and they come here. Most of them need just support, no need just show them the way and uh, they can do their own work. Uh, I was really interesting to talk with each of them last weekend and try to connect them with the people that um, they can help them and uplift the situation. Um, we are trying to have same Afghan women circle in Connecticut in New Haven. If anyone interesting to learn more or need uh, uh, to do such this program in the, their own area, we are willing to inform them and share the information. Uh, they, our email is info at elenazlight.org. Uh, you can uh, contact and uh, learn more about this because this is a need and I believe all of the women needs to have this such education and start their own ways. Instead of giving people fish, we should te teach them how to get the fish. Thank you, Farishta. Um, and it's been amazing to see in the chat already some of these introductions that you've all, all discussed. And as you can see, we've been able to build community partnerships by having these ongoing conversations and having these amazing advocates like Fareshta. What we'd like to do is, and Elena's light, is have a moment to discuss community partnerships that all of you are bringing that we can think about sharing with one another and learn from one another. Um, I think that we probably have enough time to do that as a breakout. We have a few different options for how to. So I'll defer to our facilitators if it's possible to do the three breakout rooms. Um, and what we'd like this opportunity to be is to introduce yourself and any community partnerships you have and have already built or are interested in building or if are not sure where might be the first place you would go to look and, and think about doing this. Are we able to do breakout rooms? I believe so. <clears throat> Lee, I don't know if you were taking control of this, but I'm happy yeah. to. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm happy to help. Yeah. Um, so I will open up three different rooms and folks can um, choose or I can put them randomly. Julia, if that works for you. Um, uh, and I can do that. No problem. Uh, just give me one moment and I will get that set up. Okay. Maybe, I think a random assignment is uh, more perfect. I love it. All right. I am going to open these rooms and um, we will have a assignment of all of these. Okay. All right. Opening them up in three, two, one. And um, I think maybe we can come back in about 10 to 12 minutes. Awesome. That sounds great. Perfect.
I think I may have lost my breakout room. If you if you go at the bottom to breakout room, it should say join. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, it looks like you're in room three. <laughs> also, Julia, I'm not sure about 10 or 12 minutes. It's 12 now. We have until 12.15. Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe so more like five or six minutes. Five or six sounds perfect. Sounds good. Yeah, feel free to just bring us back when you think. And I'm in room three. Or no, mm -hmm. Francis in three, I see. Francis. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, since the randomness, I am going to move you over uh, to room one. Perfect. Thank you. No problem. Francis, do you want to go to one too? Um, I'm feeling. I think we were each going to go to one room. So I can go to room two, I guess, if first is in room three. Awesome. Thanks. No problem. Thank you, Lee. No problem. Yeah, thank you for doing this. Of course. All right. Yep, Fresh is in room three. We've got Julia in room one and room two will be available for you, Francis. You just have to click join. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Great. And for those of you um, who are still in this main room, let us know if you're having difficulties joining your breakout room. Well, I think this is a good time for me to, to leave since I need okay, to go. This was yeah. amazing. I love the breakout sessions and uh, we'll debrief, okay? Have okay. a good one, Maria. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sounds thanks, great. Thanks a million, um, Lee. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay, we got folks going into the rooms, which is great. And Janine, we'll just do Q&A as we need to. Yes. You know, but the breakout session is much better, I think, unless, because I see only a few questions in the chat. Yeah, and I, um, <clears throat> of course, I have some questions if it gets a little um, silent, but yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, do you want to read the questions in the chat or shall I? Oh, uh, yeah, you can. There's only one, I think. Oh, I and I actually was... forwarded it to Julia. To... I saw it. I see one from Caroline. Caroline. Yeah, I thought yeah. there was one. I thought there were, I, oh, I counted three. Maybe I lied. Um... I see a couple of comments, but that's the only real question I think I ran across. Oh, okay. All right, I'm happy to read that one. But I'm here just working in the background. So yeah, we started it at 11.55, so I think maybe 12.05, does that give us enough time, Ingrid? Because I know that there is, um, there's a fair bit of like getting in and getting out, um, so I wouldn't want to, uh, you know, shortchange it or give it too much. What do you think, Janelle? Sounds good? I was going to say maybe, well, I know like not a huge difference, but like maybe 12.04. <laughs> <laughs> just a totally. little bit but yeah yeah mm -hmm. um and so maybe um letting folks know now that they have like a five minute warning mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then we can kind of use that you know extra minute in terms of buffering mm -hmm. okay i'll do that in just one moment Thank you. Hi, folks. Just to let you know that we are giving you about a five minute warning uh, and then we will be closing the rooms and drawing you back in. Uh, but please let us know if you need any help by coming back to the main room.
Lee, I'm not sure if the presenters have like a wrap up slide they want to present before we okay. show the MHTTC slides. Yeah, I, I wish I knew, uh, but no unfortunately, worries. I don't. <laughs> I appreciate you thinking ahead. Yeah, um, no worries. I, I got it want, ready to go. So whenever yeah, we need I just it. Want, perfect. Thank you. Of course. Yeah, of course, and definitely they will have. They are the stars of the show, so I will. <laughs> I'm happy to help and do whatever is needed. Looks like there's some good conversation going on. Oh, that's great. Just because I can tell that people are unmuted and talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes I like breakouts even better than Q&A sessions. Mm -hmm. That could be smaller and less intimidating. Mm -hmm. And more, maybe better outcomes, mm. better connections, you know. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the rooms. Welcome back, folks. Room three, it looks like you guys win getting back here the fastest. <laughs> Wish I had prizes, but I don't. <laughs> yes, we just had a like very short introduction and move it fast. <laughs> awesome. All right, welcome back, folks. I hope that your time was brief, but good in the breakout rooms. And I'll hand it back over to Julia, Francis, and Faresha. Thank you all so much. I mean, just that that glimpse into all of the expertise that's here is really wonderful. And hopefully thinking about some connections and ideas came from those introductions as well. Um, and um, what we wanted to kind of close out on is thinking about the idea of cultural humility, which I know is a central component of, of this group as well. Um, and where we really are trying to think not that we can ever become competent, but that we really are thinking about ideas of self-evaluation, self-critique. This is from the original kind of um, definition, um, redressing power imbalances in the patient-physician dynamic and thinking about how we can develop mutual beneficial and non-paternalistic clinical and advocacy partnerships. Um, so really kind of going to this, this original definition and thinking critically about what we're doing. I mentioned at the start, I am always learning, um, certainly making mistakes along the way. And Fresh and I were both reflecting you know, along with Francis that there's a lot of, um, uh, it's hard to predict uh, kind of what these partnerships and uh, what the future held for all of us. Um, and she has a bit to share from where this photo was first taken. This photo was taken on very, very extremely cold weather that I invited some people to share what I'm doing at, at a group called Elena's Light. It wasn't nonprofit yet. I invite some people and I surprisingly more than what I expect show up and they were supporting all uh, the work that I wanted to do. After that event, I told them I have these families, I'm teaching them, I love what I'm doing. Uh, the family love uh, communicating and continue learning. Then after that, I receive an email, text, call from a lot of people, how we can support, can we be a board member? Would you like to turn this to a nonprofit? That was the idea came and we changed it to a nonprofit. These all are the doctors, nurses, my professors at the university, I study public health, and even my agent who look for the house for us, everyone came and support. Without support, without a community, without human, the life gonna be hard and harder. 
but if we understand each other we give each other a little bit time and room to show the ability every one of us have a different talent and education this is the same thing for the refugee and immigrant community they all including myself had a very past uh, hard life but we are here to overcome all of these barriers and create a new life for ourselves and our community all of the women that you see were the women who participated in the program learn now all of them got driver license got citizenship tests uh, passed and they are part of the community each of them right now working in a different area to the community one of them is cooking in the um, in a, one of the restaurant the other one is teaching at the university and uh, the language the other lady is right now became a case manager in a resettlement agency all of them became someone but we all start from zero Again, thank you for supporting us. And I'm just, when I was hearing the talk, everyone gave me the, on the breakout room, they all wants to do something. Something is not gonna come until you do action. Talking, listening is great, but doing action is something. We have to do the action, the work and the other benefits will come after that. I'm sure this all community member you have in your area, they have a lot of resources and you are one of the resources. Start your nonprofit organization, start your training class, start whatever you think is the need. I'm, I'm sure that you will have a lot of support there after that. Um, uh, there's, there's not much to say after those wise words, um, but just some of the things that we spoke about today are just knowing that we, that there are traumatic experiences that have been likely been faced by immigrant and refugee children and families. We have a lot of potential to partner with community organizations and members to mitigate the stress and really promote thriving and look for strengths. Um, and really something that um, one of my mental health colleagues has shared with me is thinking that every single encounter we have is an opportunity to be a therapeutic encounter. At the very least, we can listen to somebody's story, validate what they have experienced, and inform them of what we know for next steps. And as Faresh just said, she wants her doctor to see her as anybody else. So with that, we'd be happy to take any questions or discussion. And this is just a lovely photo of some of our organizations all together. And we had a moment in between the pandemic and seeing patients. So thank you. Thank you. We'll open it up for folks who may have questions. Feel free to unmute yourself or uh, you can place a question in the chat and I'll be happy to read it aloud. I just wanna take this opportunity to thank our presenters for coming and sharing your stories and your brilliance uh, and really highlighting two pillars of community work, specifically working with immigrant and refugee populations, which is uh, centering those with lived experience, uh, as well as partnering with community organizations and institutions to do uh, some of this critical work. So thank you both, or thank you all rather, for, for showing up uh, and sharing uh, some information with us. This was really great. All right, so Julia, we'll just switch screens so we can finish up with some um, highlighting, I'm sorry, housekeeping things. <clears throat> and thank you for sharing that resource, uh, Caroline, in the chat. I have a question just as we close out uh, for our presenters. Can you um, kind of offer some suggestions, especially kind of operating in the space of cultural humility for um, behavioral health agencies to partner with community organizations? Like what could be some practical tips of navigating that space uh, and doing it effectively? I'll pass it to you, Julia. <laughs> As I was looking over to Foresta because I think um, one of the things that I, 
I, I am constantly learning is just the importance of showing up and being present. And that's how a lot of this started. Um, it's like I said, it's hard to kind of know what the end product is going to be. And that is the whole idea of working in community-based participatory work um, in a lot of different angles, whether that's research or direct care for patients and individuals. Um, we just don't know exactly what the, the the identified needs of a community are or the best way to approach solutions without just being present, building trust and kind of learning as much as we can before taking action too. Um, so it is that combination of learning and taking action. So for, for my own personal experience, as I mentioned, still learning a lot from it. A lot of this just came from showing up to the educational sessions that uh, Dr. Chang was able to first start um, uh, meeting with Freshta and hearing about where their needs are, going into the family's homes and asking questions and just kind of doing that work from the ground up um, and trying to respond to that. And then still continuing those conversations um, where where we're learning, where we're making mistakes and where we can improve. Freshta, what's been your experience with working with um, all of these medical organizations and, and people from different backgrounds? Thank you. One of the things I feel is, um, as I say the last word, see um, a refugee person as a person, same as other, respect uh, the value of time and information they are sharing with you. When I work with the researcher and the people who wants to do any work uh, with the refugee, always I said respect their times, respect um, them as someone who work with you or you work with them. Um, don't ask they do work with you for free. Like ask them how you can help them in the return, how you can. Uh, if there is any participant, any program we have, I always ask. Can we pay a little bit for the refugee who are participating in this research or on this program? Because this will give women somehow this is a work for you. They will learn, they will test if they work, how good if they can receive some money for it. Or respect them when you go to their house, when you invite them somewhere, treat them as same as your family. And I think the successful way would be if you respect someone, they will respect you in the other hand. And this can keep the relationship stronger between each community. Thank you. I appreciate those thoughtful responses. Um, we will uh, close and end here. I'll just say a few words to close us out. Thank you for everyone who participated and was able to join us. We hope that you come back. Our next session is on Wednesday, December 7th, and we'll be talking about providing culturally relevant services to families of LGBTQ plus youth. And this will be a collaboration with the Center of Excellence on LGBTQ plus behavioral health. Again, our funding comes from SAMHSA, which requires us to evaluate our services. <clears throat> there is a survey chat being, or survey link being put in the chat. He also saw a uh, way to access the survey on the previous slide. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming. If you have any questions, a few of us will stick around um, to uh, continue to create community. If you want more information about the New England Mental Health Technology Transfer Center or about our REACH Learning community, please contact uh, me or Maria on the emails listed here. Again, thank you all. We hope you have a great afternoon and we hope to see you next time.